Hello and welcome back to Guillotined 18th Century Chemist Theater. Today we are going to continue our little journey through the periodic table, hitting on the families right next to the last families we talked about, the alkaline earth metals and the halogens. And so we'll follow the same format, talking a little bit about properties, and then some of the characteristics of some of the famous ones in the family. And so we'll start with the alkaline earth metals. They start with two valence electrons. And that, that means that they are going to be less reactive than the alkaline metals because that means they have to lose two valence electrons and not one valence electron. It's also very important to remember that uh, the, the term alkaline earth metal is different than the term alkali metal. So there is no such thing as an alkali earth metal or an alkaline metal. So just be careful about that terminology. So all alkaline earth metals uh, tend to be less reactive as group one, as we pointed out before. And they're still reactive. Um, they do need some neat stuff. And, but these are probably the metals that you're going to be able to get your hands on. It's a nice blend of reactivity, but not craziness. And so uh, magnesium, calcium, not unheard of to be able to get your hands on in the laboratory. Um, losing two electrons will take a little bit more effort than one. And like the alkali metals, the reactivity will increase going down the family, like all metals. And again, due to some structural reasons we'll talk about, why that reactivity increases down a family a little later in the course. Um, and again, as you might suspect, they are harder, uh, denser, and have higher melting points. If you've ever got your piece on a, hands on a piece of magnesium, you'll definitely notice that, that it's tougher than something like sodium metal. So a couple of the alkaline earth metals that are worth talking about. Beryllium is a lot of fun for you fans of The Wizard of Oz. Uh, it's the primary source of an emerald's color, which is kind of neat. Magnesium, a light metal used in construction. Uh, when it oxidizes, it actually burns with a characteristic bright white light, uh, if you've ever seen magnesium burn, um, and produces uh, magnesium oxide, a, a very, dis very distinct white powder. Uh, but if you just leave it out, uh, magnesium, the outer coating of it, will oxidize and pr uh, protect against further oxidation. And a lot of these less reactive metals will do that. More reactive metals will just keep oxidating. Uh, but uh, alkaline earth metals and then group 13 also with like aluminum will oxidize to protect themselves against further oxidation. And in the center of every uh, chlorophyll molecule, uh, there is a magnesium ion. And so uh, life on earth is really uh, thanks to the power of photosynthesis. And photosynthesis relies on magnesium. So... Thank you, magnesium. Calcium, we all know calcium's great stories about its importance to biological structure, whether it be bone, shell, teeth, or claw. All of these things are built off of calcium. And you'll find it in a lot of construction too, non-organic. Limestone, gypsum, plaster, Paris, all these things uh, contain calcium and marble. By the way, uh, bonus quest, uh, figure out where that little milk carton came from. He's, he's uh, quite the character. And so group 17 are the halogens. They're right next to the noble gases. Now they're going to start with seven valence electrons. That gets them one short of a full octet. And that means they're going to be extremely reactive. Because again, they only need to gain one more electron to get to that full outer shell. So they will do a lot to make that happen. Now the nonmetals have a opposite reactivity trait than or trend than the metals. So although metals become more reactive as you go down a family, nonmetals become less reactive as you go down a family. And that has something to do with structure and the location of electrons relative to the pool of the nucleus. Uh, no doubt that the uh, halogens are the most reactive nonmetals because again due to the fact they only need to gain one more electron. In fact the very name halogen comes from the Latin term uh, salt former. And so, uh, so if someone calls you a salt former, uh, I don't know if that's an insult or not, but that means that you're a halogen. And as you might guess, by the way, uh, the halogens would happily react with things that want to give up electrons. And that's why uh, chlorine and sodium make such a, a fine pair, because the sodium wants to give up electrons and the chlorine wants to gain them. Um, hence, that's what's going to be called an ionic bond. And I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but we'll talk more about that later. And so we'll start with the most reactive halogen. Uh, fluorine uh, is arguably the most reactive element. Uh, many people could argue francium would be equally 
uh, reactive, but on the flip side, uh, but there's very little francium on the planet. And so due to the fact that fluorine's a tiny atom with a strong pool on new electrons, very, very difficult to isolate. In fact, uh, the guy who isolated this, Henri Moisson, ended up winning a Nobel Prize for it. Uh, beat out none other than Mendeleev himself for, I think, the 1905 Nobel Prize. And uh, then they both died uh, the next year. So uh, Dmitry Mendeleev never won a Nobel Prize because he was beaten out by the guy who isolated fluorine. So that says how important that was. Fluorine compounds, uh, interesting story, uh, have uh, uh, the ability to protect teeth against uh, tooth decay. Uh, the story behind that is that there was a, uh, a dentist who was assigned, I think, to a rural Appalachian town and found that even though their teeth were very ugly, they didn't have many cavities. And so he was able to trace that back to the high levels of natural fluorine in the water. And by controlling the amount of fluorine in the water, uh, we could have uh, stronger teeth that were not as ugly as their teeth were. And that's why many municipalities will add fluorine to their water too. Breaking Bad fans will, of course, know fluorine uh, from hydrofluoric acid, uh, the acid of choice when dissolving just about anything in that series. So, good times. Okay, and we'll hit so on a couple so of the other ones here. Some of the halogens, halogens of, of notoriety. Uh, chlorine. Uh, chlorine gas. Best known. Chlorine gas is a toxic, toxic, toxic shell gas. gas. It's very it's nasty stuff. It was used during World War I as chemical warfare. warfare. As a chemical it was a nasty gas. When chlorine gas was launched against the enemy, heavy gas in the body would settle down in the trenches, sink in the trenches, recover. And so you would get off of the stuff and essentially drown the fluid around the side. It was not a pretty way out. It was not a very pretty way out. Chemical warfare in World War I. It's just good at killing stuff. Uh, yeah, uh, it's used as a, but again, it's in smaller concentrations. It didn't really have a huge effect on the war. Leeches, people added because it's one of the leeches. One of the leeches in the corn is also gas form, which is also a very efficient way of adding it. Very cost-effective way of adding it. Most people have some kind of clean salt that they have. And then iodine also makes soda a nice disinfectant. But since as you go down the family, they become less reactive. Iodine, you can actually swap on your skin. Uh, you wouldn't obviously use bleach probably to disinfect your skin, but iodine you use all the time. That's the yellow stuff that gets swabbed on your skin at the doctor's office before a shot. A tincture of iodine, if you're old school, you might remember something called Mucurachrome, which was a bottle of iodine that you could keep around your house. You don't see too much of that around anymore. Uh, but iodine is also a trace element needed for health, which is why we iodize salt. If you don't get iodine in your diet, if I remember correctly, I think you get uh, gouter, I think. Um, but anyway... Uh, a great natural source of iodine, if you're not an iodized salt fan, is, that's right, seaweed. Yeah, good old seaweed, great source of iodine. So that was our little trip through both the alkaline earth metals and the halogens. Uh, it was fun to get to hit on some of those elements. There's a lot more of them out there if you like to do a little bit of research on your own. So I uh, hope you got something out of it. Thanks for watching, and have a, have a great day.